about next generation hospitality, emerging trends and concepts, the impact of new technologies and digitalization of the hospitality industry. Hopefully our panelists will have time to answer some of your questions. And talking about our panelists, let me introduce you, Bruno de Pujol, who is a partner at Oliver Wyman in Paris. He has more than 20 years of experience in this leading company that is part of the top, top five management consulting company in the world. And he has been the author of many uh, pieces of opinion and research on the hospitality industry, uh, such as the one in 2019 for the J20. So Bruno, welcome. Thank you. Hello. We Hello. also have Dr. Dimitrios Diamantis with uh, Le Roche Academic Dean. He is also more than 20 years of experience in teaching at Le Roche. And he has been also the author of several books on uh, tourism and especially, especially recently on ecotourism with a new book that was published uh, this year. So thank you uh, thank for you. being here, for sharing with us one hour of insightful moment. And let me start already now the conversation with a question for you, Bruno. In a recent interview that you made, I wrote that I, I read, sorry, that you were talking about a new phenomenon called revenge tourism. Can you please explain to us what it is about and also how you see it coming? Yeah, with pleasure. Um, so uh, revenge tourism is not a new concept, actually. Uh, we have seen that in uh, pretty much every uh, crisis. So this is uh, the, the fact that, for example, you take SARS uh, a few, few decades ago, uh, just after the crisis, the demand for tourism jumped uh, up to 15 percent in Asia. So this is a fact that uh, just after any kind of crisis, uh, 2009 and, and others, uh, people want to get experience, new experience and uh, want to spend their savings uh, into, uh, into leisure. Um, what we uh, observe here is the fact that it's an, an obviously an unusual uh, crisis much uh, bigger than others and the, and the level of uh, household savings is huge. You take uh, France is more than 140 billion euros, the same in UK, the same pretty much everywhere. So they're going to spend the, the, their money, not in products. Uh, it's a case in China right now, but in, in first in experience to reconnect uh, with their social network and then obviously some, some uh, retail. Um, so we, we, we have been doing a lot of models uh, to understand better the recovery. And what you see in the press is, is not leading the, the right way right now because you usually see the, the forecast from uh, the airlines, for example, that take into account the reduction of business travel, the constraints for the long haul. But if you take the, only the part of leisure, uh, we think it's going to be booming very soon, as soon as this summer. And uh, it occurred that we just finished a, um, a project and a, and a survey in the U.S., so the, right now in the U.S., you take airlines, it's already 80% of the pre-crisis uh, traffic. Uh, but if you dig, deep dive, uh, you realize that uh, leisure is already uh, 120 up, up to the 19 uh, figures as uh, in comparison, business travel is still down at 70% uh, of the recovery curve. So you, you see that uh, revenge tourism is already occurring and it will accelerate very much with uh, obviously with the vaccine uh, acceleration that is the case especially in Europe right now. Well, thank you uh, Bruno for explaining better what you mean with uh, revenge tourism but then it makes me think and I don't know Dimitrios what you think about it it makes me think that we could uh, witness again uh, traveling behaviors that are not sustainable because people will have made so many sacrifices over the last year that they feel that they deserve to get whatever they want for their own pleasure because they, they, they deserve it. Uh, and at the same time, we can also witness an evolution of ecotourism over the last month. So Dimitrios, how do you see these two contradictory trends uh, co coexisting in the future? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Steve, actually, for the question. Absolutely right. Uh, we are, um, it's, uh, right now, we are in the psychological barrier. In the psychological barrier, it means that over the period of the last year plus, 
we have seen a lot of normal travel behaviors not being exercised. And that means uh, that historically we have seen a lot of kind of staycation attitudes uh, that allowed actually consumers to stay at home and exercise some behaviors on this one. If we're going to add the international demand into the perspective, it is very true that a lot of remote-based environment can be an attraction for the tourism. And as a result of that, revenge tourism can occur in ecotourism formats. Uh, the question, however, is where, and the question is if it's destination-based, if it just visits to natural attractions, is it exercise in different type of activities, eco-based activities, is this going, is it a global kind of uh, phenomenon, does this include a European-based uh, attraction only, Latin America, Africa, and so on. So if you're taking the whole world view into the perspective where ecotourism uh, has been exercised in a remote slash natural landscapes, it's very, very true that a lot of destinations in ecotourism classic uh, areas are worried about, out of a big influx of tourism coming that can include actually I mean, can enlarge their footprint in a natural environment. Having said that, uh, over the last year, we have seen that something has happened to the consumers, that the consumers, they became a little bit more kind of skeptical about their own kind of behaviors in terms of the COVID-19 kind of guidelines. So I'm remainingly cautious, optimistic, uh, that not a lot of stress is going to be illustrated in a different kind of landscapes, natural landscapes. So in terms of numbers, yes, but in terms of actual environmental social impact, that may be actually quite um, on a neutral side at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Dimitrios. Bruno, do you have also uh, figures coming out of your research that could show that ecotourism is going to uh, stop being a niche market and start to convince the mass in a way that it could be a, 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 you know, a pleasant way to travel. Yeah, uh, ecotourism is, is uh, for us one of the mega trends uh, in tourism in the next decade. Clearly, it's probably one of the uh, of the deepest trend we we see. Uh, it took, um, this trend existed before the COVID, but mm -hmm. uh, COVID accelerated a lot of things and. Uh, mm -hmm. So the research we have been doing show that uh, today it's still a low share of uh, global uh, tourism activity, but we uh, the, the growth is uh, as twice as the growth of uh, global tourism, 8% versus 3.9 uh, uh, globally for, for tourism, the, the work we, we did with uh, WTTC. Uh, and if you, uh, if you move the line up to uh, 2030, you realize that it will be uh, one third uh, of the market uh, at that date. Uh, so it's not a detail. It's not anymore a detail. So what does it mean? Because you can include a lot of things. So obviously you, you have a lot of heritage sites or the national park that represent 45% of, of this market. But what has changed are uh, probably twofold. The first one, as uh, Dimitrios uh, said, um, uh, the, the demand changed drastically. So it's not about a, a pristine lo location. It's uh, their, their needs is increasingly complex. Uh, so they have a particip to new tourists, new nature tourists uh, have um, uh, a mindset, which is a participator. They want to be connected with the local community. They want to act. So the philanthropy is very, very important. Um, you uh, even uh, see that 36% are already ready to uh, offset their ca carbon footprint. So you, you see it's not anymore like 5-10% uh, of the population that, uh, that are sensitive. They want a new purpose for their vacation. They want a transformative, purposeful um, type of experience. And that's why nature tourism has, has a big impact. And that's the reason number one. The second reason, which is as important, is the offer side. Uh, of, of this uh, segment of market. Uh, what we sometimes don't realize enough is the, is the fact that there is a huge investment in the world in the tourism economy, hopefully, because it's a, it's a large part of the growth. Uh, you remember that uh, tourism is 10% uh, 
a bit caricatural, but uh, around 10% of the global GDP. And uh, it's even much more for some countries, 25% for Thailand. Uh, for mm. example. So it's, it's a big uh, challenge and opportunity for a lot of countries. You take China. Uh, uh, China has begun already, or will begin, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will be uh, in uh, one or two years, the first investor in tourism. So we always see sometimes Chinese as a great market to come to into Europe, but uh, you we should also see them as the first destination that will uh, that will be the case by 2030. And and what they invest in is mainly nature tourism. So they they have, for example, 11 uh, national park pilots where they they, they provide a, a full and diversified experience with a model of the Western. Uh, U.S. Uh, national park. So, and we sometimes don't see that enough, in, especially in Europe, where our proposal value proposition is very poor, unfortunately, compared to a lot of countries. So, China is uh, probably the, the biggest opportunity in terms of new development. But you take Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates also invest a lot in this kind of, of new and very attractive offer. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, I have a question for, for uh, one or the other, huh? Who, whoever feels comfortable. How can we, on one hand, have a growth of ecotourism and yet making sure that the next hotspots of uh, uh, ecotourism don't start becoming mass tourism? Because everyone will start sharing the tips on there is that beautiful uh, forest over there, there is nobody else, you are, you know, it's a very quiet space. And, and especially with the social network, everybody is going to share on Instagram the location of that beautiful lake, mountain, where it's very quiet, where nobody went before. And then it starts becoming trendy. We've seen that in many uh, natural spots that start becoming uh, impossible to manage because there is a crowd there because the lake is blue or whatever. So how can you, yeah, on one hand, expect that ecotourism grow, but on the other hand, avoid that these spaces will uh, Will not become a mass tourism tomorrow. I can take this one from the beginning, actually. And thank you, Steve. First of all, I, I mean, we try, uh, if you're looking as far as uh, arrivals, uh, ultimately a very good ecotourism resort relies on, or should rely, let's say, on a very good crowd management. So, in other words, it means that they can be able to estimate the type of a uh, tourist that they can accommodate as well as the peaks that they can have. Ultimately, if you're looking at countries that ecotourism has been practiced in the last kind of 30 years with absolutely success in critical hotspots, Australia and Canada. So Australia and Canada, from the 90s, they have, uh, if you like, strategized the amount of ecotourism activities that they can do. Um, and what they have done over there, they actually, they broke down, what do they mean by the ecosystem? So ecosystem that has been broken down to their coastal areas, mountain areas, wildlife parks, ecological sites, uh, other cultural kind of sites and so on. So by breaking down of what are their ecosystems and developing, if you like, planning activities, they can be able really to estimate the amount of arrivals that they can have. If you're looking... In the 90s, one particular bear watching activities in, um, in Point Pele and, and National Park was estimated actually on a huge economic activity for the area. The similar goes to islands like Gozo in the Mediterranean, Corsica in the Mediterranean, and so on. So you will always have ecotourism hotspots that they have a scientific beauty. And, they, and this particular activity will attract the type of travelers that they are very specialized in this type of skill uh, or this type of hobby. You will also have the of what we call the passive ecotourists, that the passive ecotourists, they will be visiting eco-sites for their own leisure element. In this particular kind of passive ecotourism, you, you might expect fluctuations of the demand depending on on the seasonality and a smart tourism destination with a proper planning, they can be able really to estimate certain arrivals if it's necessary. So if you look and say, for example, Croatia, that they're getting a lot of their arrivals via 
via car, either from Germany or other from Austria, and they tend to traditionally attract a lot of eco-tourists slash families, they can be able also to estimate this kind of arrival so they can minimize some traffic flows. Of course, it depends. And of course, the tourism by definition is a global activity. So you can plan it as much as you can, but you always need to anticipate the unexpected. Thank you, Dimitrios. Yeah, very uh, interesting answer and reassuring one. And if I, if I may, I think Chris uh, says uh, the essential point, but if I can illustrate with a few things, it's very interesting to see that um, protected area uh, is a recent phenomenon. So uh, mm -hmm. the surface has been multiplied by, by uh, four uh, since uh, the 80s. So it's a very recent offer uh, mm -hmm. beside the US National Park that uh, mm -hmm. come from the 30s, from the New Deal, uh, period uh, with Roosevelt. So, by the way, we are in the same kind of period. So, it could be an opportunity for government to uh, to push this kind of uh, very attractive offers. Uh, but it's really an 80 thing. So, it has been very late, and demand followed very drastically mm -hmm. and, and follows the curve of the mm -hmm. uh, of the opening of new protected area and national parks. So, um, and the the growth is still very high. Uh, so that that's what we said. The, there is more demand, but offer increase at, at the same pace. So mm -hmm. we think that at one point, if it's well controlled, and Dimitri said very well, uh, Dimitri also said said it very well. Uh, it should be okay, and we sh you should preserve the density and the and the pristine uh, dimension of these sites. All right. Thank you very much, Bruno and Dimitri, for. For the ecotourism trend, that is one of the the booming one. Now, Bruno, in the recent years, we've seen a um, rise of uh, lifestyle concepts or non-traditional hospitality. I would say we've seen the launch of brands like Mama Shelter, Twenty Five Hour, Joe and Joe, Moxie, the Student Hotel, etc. Do you see it as tomorrow's norm, and they will replace little by little those big historical chains? that were more standardized in a way, or will it remain marginal? So um, we see lifestyle are, are uh, um, a very interesting non-traditional concept today in hospitality. Uh, this is not the only one. You we could talk about extended stay, soft brand, co-working, but we think that lifestyle is one of the more disruptive one for several reasons. First, uh, it's really adapted to the post-COVID world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as we said previously, post-COVID will be more leisure, a bit less business travel. Um, uh, at least this is what we, we see from our latest survey. Uh, you know, high, um, elite travelers uh, think that for more than 50%, they, they will work more from home. Uh, and the average we just released from the latest survey is uh, basically it will be plus two days work from home. So it's huge. They realize that they can manage their relationship more. Um, we are uh, using a video conference much more than before. And this trend uh, is still increasing uh, along, the, along the crisis or so along the survey we make. They are more and more confident in the fact that uh, probably they will not do as many uh, travel uh, as before. Uh, so we anticipate uh, a certain decrease in the business travel, depending on the study, it's uh, minus 15, minus 20 percent. Um, but uh, leisure, as we said, will increase not only with the revenge tourism, but with the, the need of experience that, that, will, uh, that will follow. What is great with the lifestyle uh, model it's a kind of pleasure uh, model that makes uh, both, both of them. And as we know, short trip is uh, always growing in the, in the demand side. And so the, this is a perfect model that is very adapted to this uh, new world. The second reason is the fact that it's a performance business model. Uh, if you take the, the GOP's uh, gross operating revenue by uh, square meters, is sometimes plus 40, plus 50 percent. So due to a very simple reason, there is a huge investment in the common area, um, the restaurant, the bars, with a lot of animation. But the rooms are usually a bit uh, smaller than uh, the regular standards. So you, you make savings on the room. And the, the primary purpose is really 
the the social area, communal uh, living space, and uh, and uh, fun uh, meeting rooms, which makes all the difference. So we think it's a very robust one, and uh, you you take the pipeline. Pipeline is, is huge, uh, plus twenty percent uh, growth per year, uh, and for some uh, larger chain, it can be eighty percent of the pipeline right now. So we think it's a very attractive uh, model. And uh, we we think that is very adapted to uh, adaptive and uh, for every segment uh, for this uh, new world. Okay, thank you, uh, Bruno. Uh, Dimitrios, how could historical groups who, are, who have network of hundreds of properties uh, based on, uh, I would say, the traditional way of operating hotels with uh, 200 rooms and uh, 15 meeting rooms, etc. How could they transform uh, with the inertia that it represents? How can they transform to cope with that new trend and these new behaviors? Is it possible or um, or, or they have to just shut down the everything and build yeah. from scratch everything? Yeah, absolutely. I, we see a lot of examples. Thank you, Steve, for the question. I think we see a lot of examples of properties um, that they try to have important touch points in terms of their guest experience, that they have certain lifestyle elements on that. And that goes on pre-trip, during trip, and post-trip experiences. So on the pre-trip, you can see that there are reservation systems, especially on their web pages. They try actually to fight uh, in inverted commas, the OTAs, and as a result of that, to encourage actually a more direct bookings. As a way on that, they try to also to offer them a degree of personalization that uh, that allows actually a little bit more lifestyle experience uh, towards the reservation states. During the stay, you can also see that a lot of kind of areas inside a big hotels in a way, they have also been transformed to a more kind of lifestyle element. You only need to see, I mean, we used to go with MBAs in Chicago and we used to visit the high regions in Chicago and a lot of actually their open spaces have been transformed to lifestyle elements in pre-COVID times to accommodate this kind of grouping of segments and encourage actually this kind of integration. And most importantly, you can also see the follow-up that is happening on the properties uh, after the stay. So in other words, through the data mining and through other kind of activities, they try to understand better their consumer. Now, if you're going to take, however, the big capacity that they have in terms of rooms, and how can you be able to transform this particular kind of rooms to a more kind of lifestyle element, Everything is about really on design of the experiences. So ultimately, you will see a lot of effort being placed by every single hotel brand. I mean, from Accor to Mario to Intercontinental on lifestyle elements inside their classic historical kind of brands in order to allow a little bit more personalization. Of course, room rates play a big role into this. So ultimately, the more if you like it, the more you will go to these dimensions, the more you will see the fluctuations of the room rate depending on these activities. But uh, emphasis has been placed because that's pretty much a trend and that depends really from destination to destination, of course. Talking about transforming the hotel, Bruno, do you have in your, in your studies, on your research, uh, a vision of what could be the future of the hotel uh, if let's say there are 15 meeting rooms today, maybe they don't need that many because there is less people traveling for business in the next years. So what, what, how would the hotel of the future look like? Well, uh, size will, uh, will be as diversified as, uh, as now, depending on, on the demand, the location. So, but uh, I think that the, the mindset uh, will change drastically. Uh, as Dimitrios said, and lifestyle is a great example of the, the change we experience right now. Um, uh, we, we come from a world uh, for the last 30 years where brand um, and, uh, let's say, standardized product were the dominant model. So we, we are in a, in a world uh, more and more where you're going to have uh, more niche brands. And Lifestyle is a great example of that. And you, you mentioned all of them and there are many more. And I, I think the, we, we, made, we made a survey a few years ago. Uh, in average, uh, there, there was uh, three brands created per year in, in, in Lifestyle. So you see how fast it goes. But the, 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 you cannot have a portfolio of an IBIS 
in, in the world, uh, you can have just a few hundreds maximum. So uh, hotel chain transform their, their model into a portfolio of very diversified uh, concept, but very strong concept. And, and so probably we go from a world in the hotel of the future from a brand centric model to a more community centric model. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be very innovative uh, with the creation of experience, uh, of event management, um, and that changes everything. And even in, in the way you, you hire uh, your, 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 the staff uh, of the hotel, uh, you, you're gonna, let's say, go beyond the classical uh, hotel schools to a, a more diversified origin or, or, or of employees that will go from a restaurant, cl classical retail, uh, everything linked to uh, to experience. Another uh, dimension which is very interesting is you go from a let's say uh, centered model around uh, you know marketing with a single umbrella brand to a very highly distincted uh, brand content uh, with a very strong concept where you try to to sell much more direct with a lot of uh, value added services. So it's going to be mm -hmm. le less dynamic pricing and more, uh, you know, more packaging where experience uh, in terms of share of re revenue will be beyond 50%. And, and that, I think w w this is what will make the difference. Uh, lifestyle, one of the lifestyle definition, for example, is the fact that let's say out of the room revenue is beyond 50%. So this is a primary uh, uh, share of, uh, of revenue. And you, you, we, we observe this phenomena in, uh, in, in many trends. You take luxury, where we, we have more and more the, this model. And the relationship will be, uh, by definition, a one-to-one -one guest activation strategy. So uh, the hotel of the future uh, will be much more focused on, let's say, not only very focused on uh, how to accommodate you, but how to create uh, a full and diversified experience. Is it fair to say that because, as you just said, more than 50% of the revenue is not on the room side, is it fair to say that for the moment during the pandemic, it's a, it's a big risk for these brands because uh, the whole experience relies on the social, social socialization of the guests in, in the bar, in restaurants such as Mama Shelter, for example, or Joe and Joe. Um, so it's funny because yeah, on, one, on one hand, it's an emerging train, but on the other hand, uh, they, they, they should struggle at the moment with uh, generating revenue in those social areas. For, for sure, but uh, I'll bet it that it will come back very soon. And it's already coming back, and uh, hopefully uh, the Delta version uh, will not harm us uh, as much as the previous wave, and uh, they will they will be able to come back uh, in the let's say more regular model. Um, but uh, the social connection, I think, is a very uh, uh, strong tr and lasting trend. Thank you, Bruno. You were talking about the evolution of business traveling. Um, if I extend it a little bit, can we talk about the evolution of the, the big events, you know, the big fairs, uh, the motor show in Geneva, the Basel World uh, uh, Watch uh, Fair, and even the Olympic Games. Uh, do you know if the event industry is going gonna, is gonna to look like before COVID once the pandemic is uh, under control, or will it change forever with new forms of event organization? I don't know who wants to take that one, Dimitrios? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, we have uh, recently actually visited over here the Palespo in Geneva with MBA students. And we had and we did follow this events page quite well through our affiliation. And what is interesting is that they they had to redefine, they have to redefine of what do they mean by the event product. I mean, the event product traditionally was a duration of uh, different kinds of days that participants are visiting a hosting institution that they can be able really to showcase their products. Now, uh, by be able actually now to redefine that, it means that certain events need to happen digital in order to allow the engagement, the integration to happen even before the event in order to maximize the productivity during the event. So that, in, in other words, it means that at this moment in time that we are, 
uh, in this moment in time, in July 2021, it, it means that they, it needs to be actually a digitalization element to that. Now, when the times will allow us to go back to this kind of format of the event, I think that will not be disturbed a lot simply because of the economic impact of the event to the host destination. So we're talking about one to six in the city of Geneva, one Swiss franc equal to six as an economic impact in terms of direct economic impact to the economy. So ultimately, that will not going to be disturbed a lot uh, looking ahead. Right now, and the experience of COVID, it means that certain engagement, a certain productivity engagement of the participant towards the event host, that can increase really the digitalization. The other most important thing is that a lot of event spaces have created their own brand. And by doing that, it means that the branding of these events can happen not only in the traditional environments, but in other environments. So Palespo, for example, can be able to host other events outside of Switzerland in the more micro scale perspective, simply because the event is becomes actually now a brand that the brand can be able actually to be spread around. It's a bit kind of Euro 2020 model that we have seen that of spreading of the event in order to, uh, to capture actually this particular kind of impact. So this is actually an experiment. This is a pilot and, and ultimately that's an interesting one if it's here to stay or if it goes to the more kind of traditional formal looking ahead. So the events absolutely play a critical role. The methodology, however, is very much dependent on timing simply because of the COVID slash other restrictions that do exist. Yeah. Bruno, do you, do you want to add something on that? Do you have a... Yeah, uh, I, I think event is a, is a fantastic uh, experimental, uh, uh, for, for, uh, experimental ground for, for us in the post-COVID era because there mm. is a lot of things going on right now and uh, a lot of changes. So uh, I think overall, I totally uh, agree with Dimitrios, it will recover. Uh, what is uh, really interesting is uh, to, to look at the different segments inside the event and to mm -hmm. understand what, what's going on. Um, what we see, uh, we work right now on, on this with some uh, operators. Uh, first, digital play a huge role, uh, not only because they are during the crisis, uh, some hybrid model uh, have been developed uh, with great success sometimes. Um, but also due to the fact that e e even in the very physical uh, uh, event, you have a lot of immersive uh, technology that accelerated uh, during, uh, during the crisis. Um, and the, the last part I would say is uh, the pace of recovery of the different segment. You, we, we anticipate that the National Congress uh, or corporate events will clearly uh, have a, rap a re very rapid recovery. Uh, corporate, I think, have a great future because there is a not only there is a quick rebound of local uh, corporate uh, event, but also there is this need that is confirmed by the survey to really reconnect in a world when you where you travel uh, and less and where you you work more from home. So um, uh, we, we see that if they adapt a bit their model, it can be a very uh, attractive uh, model for the for the futures. Uh, on the other side, uh, international congress or uh, general public trade fair and exhibition will suffer for a while, unfortunately, due to the fact that international travel uh, will, will take time to, uh, long haul, I mean, will take time to, yeah. to, to recover. And due to the fact that there is a new tendency, which is concentration, uh, concentration of the market on the, on the biggest cities um, due to savings needs on, on some uh, on some sectors so there is a fierce competition and probably the, the biggest destination geneva paris will, will stay very competitive uh, hopefully uh, but uh, let's say secondary destination we will uh, suffer a lot so a lot of things going on in this market but mm -hmm. still a great potential uh, and uh, reinvention uh, to, uh, to to continue uh, to observe in the coming years mm -hmm. So to make sure I understood what you are saying is that because we will still anyway uh, work more from home than before COVID, uh, this pattern will remain to have maybe an hybrid, uh, let's say 20%, uh, 40% working from home uh, that will stay. Because of that, 
it will make us want even more to attend some events, to be at least for one, two, three days, 100% mm. connected to the industry mm. and, and focus on that uh, to compensate also in a way the lack of uh, connection and socialization that we have uh, the rest of the year. Mm. Yeah, okay. we, we, we anticipate a steady growth of, of this uh, segment in the uh, event market. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Bruno. Feel free to ask your questions in the comments uh, so that uh, we can pick some of them and uh, have a, our panelists trying to answer them. Don't hesitate. Bruno, you were talking about uh, digitalization and uh, I think it's, uh, it has been accelerated uh, because of COVID. It was already uh, very important for the hospitality industry over the last years, but now uh, companies have no choice but uh, you know, to accelerate their transformation. Can you already predict what will be the next digital disruption in hospitality? So, uh, that, that, it's a huge... Uh, <laughs> you, so that I know where I invest my money. <laughs> Try to scratch the surface on this one. Now, um, that, that I, for, for me, there are two, two main uh, uh, patterns which are really interesting. The, the first one is, um, let's say, the distribution space and, and the platform evolution. Um, so giant platform and, and digital giant are uh, somehow under pressure because they, they, they had a huge growth over the last decades, uh, consolidating the, the, the worldwide inventory. Uh, and we know all of them, Booking, Expedia, uh, uh, did a, gr a great job. Today, they, are, they, they face, uh, let's say, two challenges. First, there is still some regional players that uh, have um, managed to, to conquer and protect uh, some space. So you, you know them in, in Asia, Traveloka, Make My Trip, uh, Despega, and so on. So this is a fair challenge and uh, the consolidation uh, growth is, uh, is less important. And the second one is uh, the fact that the end-to-end uh, the -end journey uh, which has been the target for, for many of them, a lot of uh, digital platform where, wherever the, the market they claim to, um, is, a, is a very high challenge. A uh, lot of them try to uh, consolidate, let's say, the travel part of it, but realizing that it's sometimes a commodity and doesn't bring uh, additional traction. So having a flight engine, having taxi, having all these kind of mobility uh, um, add-on is not something that creates a, a huge difference. On the other side, if you if you go downstream, it's a very different uh, story. And when you add experience, and that echo the previous discussion we had on nature tourism, on the focus on experience uh, post uh, post COVID, it's you create a lot of additional conversion, and this is very interesting. You take a, a, a home run, a home rental leader, uh, you put. A, uh, countryside offer, which is not a lot of uh, traction in the market. You you had uh, uh, an attraction park uh, in in a package, and you may multiply by four or five the the rate of conversion. So it's very interesting to say that if you had activities uh, on your on your site, uh, you you create a, a, an additional value proposition, more experience, more. Uh, purposeful when you organize your, your vacation or, or, or your trip. Airbnb did a great job. Get your guide, our emerging market specialized on, on this one. And then you have also space for specialists. You take a Traveloski, Maeva, uh, in the, especially in the, in the French Alps or in the, let's say, in the mountain destination. You can find some specialist model with a richer uh, offer uh, that really create a, a difference with a better uh, business model. So that's the, the first thing. And the second one is, uh, let's say, uh, along with uh, the classical digitalization of our world, travel and, and leisure is the biggest uh, digital market in the world before retail. And so is at the vanguard of, of many uh, te technological uh, innovation. So uh, frictionless multimodal experience, uh, optimize uh, uh, travel with time service uh, saving uh, services. Sometimes uh, AI um, assisted knowledge and decision. Uh, you have uh, all all the socially connected offers um, and so on and so forth. 
that creates, uh, if you manage them well, uh, huge upsides in terms of revenue. Uh, we say usually that friction, um, frictionless experience represents 20 to 30 percent revenue increase. Personalized, true personalized offer can represent 20 percent upside too. So all these um, smart developments make a huge difference in terms of commercial effectiveness and marketing effectiveness. So you see it uh, led by pure players uh, who, like the OTA, would take commissions out of the providers of experiences, right? Yeah, but I think an operator has a great revenge to take, <laughs> if, I, if I may. Uh, because due to the fact that uh, you, the, the need or, or the demand uh, is more and more on experience, it's uh, more and more complex to, uh, to provide. And so operator has natural structural advantage to provide this uh, diversified experience. And because of global uh, platform, uh, have the scalability uh, challenge in mm -hmm. front of them because if they make their offer too complex, friction can reduce the, 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 the conversion rate. Uh, the, this is a challenge or this is a space where operator can really uh, make the different offering uh, diversified packages. And so probably we are in a new era where um, let's say pre predefined packages will come back versus the last decade where we had uh, you know self self packaging uh, model which were very uh, attractive to, to consumers. Yeah. We, we have a, a question comment uh, from the audience saying, uh, so you are saying that the huge platforms like Booking.com will lose market share and specialized platforms will be the platforms who will grow in the upcoming years? Is it uh, a good summary? I won't say, I, won't, I will not say that uh, Booking.com or, or Expedia will lose market share. I think it's a growing market. Uh, and uh, um, the... the if you take uh, hospitality uh, only, it's always the same. The, the, this is how you define your market. But if you define your market with a global tourism, including all the experience beyond accommodation, there is a, a huge share to take. And that's where operator can, uh, can, can take the lion's share because it's very difficult for digital platform. So it's a, again, it's not a story of uh, sharing the pizza. It's a story of... Uh, uh, enlarging the size of the pizza. <laughs> enlarging and taking the, the lion's share of the growth. Okay. Yeah, and I also see actually another kind of uh, kind of a couple of additions. First of all, uh, we are moving towards a more castless society. And so, so that's one clear trend. The other trend is that the role of omni-channel. So uh, you have seen that very successfully a lot of retail spaces like Moncler in Milano in Italy they have invested heavily pre-COVID times in China on their omni-channel experience. And that served them quite well during the COVID-19 times. So the COVID-19 times, they hit it hard as far as actually the European area, except the luxury market in China, that Montclair uh, did quite well. Now, what did we learn from there is that how in the hospitality sector and tourism sector, can we be able to adapt or to if you like to approach omni-channel experience from the consumer side, but also from the data gathering side, because ultimately uh, when you're looking at the consumer journey is not only um, the, the services that you provide, but the data actually that you can have to analyze and to generate certain ideas for innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's actually quite also interesting. And that's why I agree with Bruno that, um, the booking.com is not the size of the pizza, but about how also the big players like the booking.com, they will also approach those two trends. And the number one, the cashless, and the number two, the omnichannel experience. So that's how I think it will reinforce than anything else. Yeah. We have a $1 million question uh, <laughs> for if you, if you can answer it. What will be your advice for hotels opening in post-COVID time? What new technologies they have to implement? I guess you partially started to answer, Dimitrios, with the data management, data gathering, and being able to make the best use out of the data to customize the message and the experience. Is yeah. there other technology that uh, would be uh, impossible to avoid? Yeah, I mean, there are technologies that they are uh, consumer-led technologies, and there are also technologies that they are actually hotel-led. 
So there are technologies that, uh, like the apps, for example, another uh, reservation system, check-in, etc. They are consumer-led technology to make actually consumer journey a little bit more seamless. So I do see technologies that they avoid co conduct. Uh, and as a result of that, allows really consumers to go directly into their rooms without even actually engaging and communicating, depending on the destinations that you operate. Because you always need to remember that depending on the destinations and uh, depending on the type of consumers that you're targeting, some consumers, they don't wish to have a lot of interaction with a hotel as a host, and some others actually they do encourage it depending on the segmentation. Uh, on the other hand, you also have a new operating system in terms of data management. That it means that allows hotels that are gathering all this data on cloud, that they can be able really also to do their um, analytics in a way that helps them out for fast decision making. So it's not really of getting data for data gathering, uh, carrying the data with you and become heavy loaded, but allows you actually a more fast data analysis for uh, decision making. So yes. Uh, depending on the budget, of course, you can invest. Depending on the resources, uh, the more resources that you have available, the more you can invest in seamless technologies and data analytics that helps you out. Yeah. So probably to invest in a good property management system uh, to, to to be able to, yeah. to 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 have a personalized data and and then personalize the upcoming stay of the clients. Yeah, and Oracle does quite a good job, and a couple of others that can be able to really also to yeah. Um, we are talking about technologies in hotels and you were talking about maybe some clients in the future because of technology could go straight to their room without having to talk to any human being. Mm -hmm. And it leads to another question from the audience, which is how does it impact the skills and the, the quality that someone will need uh, to work in the hospitality in the future? Uh, because, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different, different daily life for someone working in a hotel. What do you think, Dimitrios? So how, how do you how do you adapt the, the the teaching of the new skills in a school like La Roche? Yeah, um, thank you, Sibyl, for the question. And um, yes, absolutely. One of the most important emphasis uh, at the moment in the hospitality is the appreciation of soft skills. Uh, hard skills are actually taught, but ultimately, soft skills and um, and understanding of those particular attitudes are very, very important. The word is really agility, that uh, we need to really to be able to educate, and we're educating our students to become agile. Agile, it means uh, to be able really to accept and also to implement in a very, very fast kind of way. Uh, that uh, the trends are driven by society, and as a result of that, it means that also our curriculum is driven by the needs of the industry, but ultimately of what we anticipate is going to happen. So understanding the industry is a critical thing, and also agility that the students they need to have to fit really into these trends and to these needs of the brand. Thank you. I hope it answered the question from Sibyl. Mm -hmm. We have another question, maybe for you, Bruno. Uh, besides revenue sharing with existing experience providers, do you think hotels would be willing to create, for example, their own self-guided tours in augmented reality or mixed reality mm -hmm. based on micro transaction? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see what's, uh, what's going to happen. Um, if if uh, I see what we observe, in the, for example, in emerging countries, uh, especially in the Middle East right now, we see that hotel and resort go more and more into the experience side. So not, uh, not only uh, in luxury, where they are very strong providing um, uh, additional experience for, for their luxury guests, but also you take Rixos, uh, they, they are more and more going to a really near, nearly uh, uh, an attraction park with a, with a lot of, of activities in, inside. And if you take these example or uh, which I mean, we know we know them uh, for for a, lot, a long time. Cent, uh, Cent, Center Park uh, was uh, was already at the vanguard in, in this kind of model of hospitality plus plus activities. You realize that it's always a, an hybrid model. Uh, you you want to do uh, the most profitable or the the one that you control. You are able to control. You want to do that by yourself or the one that are strategic to have uh, a really good experience uh, for your guests. 
and other that are less critical or more difficult to operate, you're going to uh, subcontract or define partnership. So uh, the, the, the frontier between sometimes resorts and, uh, and parks uh, are thinner and thinner. And it's very interesting because on the other side, uh, parks go into hospitality because it's a, it's a huge uh, opportunity to increase length of stays and, and uh, immersive experience. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as you said, the, the point is to concentrate on your on your core business, your what you master the most, what is strategic to to own, and then to outsource uh, what is really uh, upon skills, knowledge that don't correspond to your core business. And um, yeah, I think if a hotel tomorrow has to start creating their old uh, self guiding tours, uh, it requires uh, in house talent to do that people who will uh, master uh, not only the knowledge of the, two, the, the the surroundings, but also the technology and, uh, and, uh, and the cost linked to, to, to that technology development. So maybe for this kind of experiences, it's better to outsource to a, a trustful partners. Thank you. Looking at the questions that we have, um, no, I think we covered... Uh, we covered them. Uh, is there anything else, Bruno or Dimitrios, you want to add uh, to finish that uh, conversation on the you know, last word on what's next for hospitality? And is it yeah. bright or is it dark? No, it's very, it's bright. I think it's bright. It's like any button that when you turn it, it's getting brighter, right? So it depends really your connectivity. But in reality, I, I think um, my reflection is really to link the topics to together because we talk about the revenge tourism at the beginning and revenge tourism equals to revenge spending and ultimately we moved actually to ecotourism and ultimately to the future of, of hotels. So ultimately if you link it together I think one of the things that we clearly have learned with ecotourism is the small scale but educational perspectives. So one of the critical things why tourists they go for ecotourism activities is to get a form of education by the eco-tour operator. So education is a critical part of eco-lodges and eco-activities. If we transfer that into the hospitality, and to me about the future of hotels uh, centers around experience, but ultimately who is brave enough from the hotel sector to start really to educate consumers about their activities and their products and their destinations and how those can be manifested either in technology or one-to-one, -one, I think that depends really from the destination. So I'll see a, the role of education, not only in the classic formal like us at La Rose, but in the industry and how the brands can be able also not to serve, but at the same time, educate consumers that they become ultimately super loyal to their brand. So I do see this kind of uh, bridge at the moment between ecotourism and classic models uh, in terms of the principles and the philosophy, uh, we wait and see. And as you mentioned, Steve, it's a million dollar question. So I'm sure we cover back in the future on that one. Bruno, uh, is there other elements that you foresee with uh, all the research you are doing that uh, Dimitrios did, have time to develop job. today? Dimitrios did a great job uh, for, for this conclusion. But if I may add uh, one, one point with this market I've been suffering for the last two years, uh, as never, uh, it has been a, a dramatic period of time, but uh, really uh, I'm very optimistic. I think that the coming year is going to be fantastic in terms of innovation, uh, new product, new new way of doing this, uh, this great uh, work and job uh, in, in many dimensions. Uh, uh, hopefully uh, we, we had a chance to share this uh, optimism uh, today, but, uh, you know, we talk about the experiential revolution. We talk about the frictionless uh, journey. We talk about the demand explosion around the, the world. Uh, we, we didn't talk about uh, infrastructure re uh, infrastructure revolution, but airports going to get revolutionized by, by biometric to, to make flows easier and so on. So everywhere you look at, there, there are some drastic change and for the best. So I'm, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great... Uh, great uh, industry to be in. 
Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Dimitrios, for your precious time and for your expert insights today. And thank you for the audience for attending this conversation and keep the passion for this industry, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for coming to listen to us. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.